Hello everybody, this is another Grief Awareness Week conversation. I am delighted that Anghara George Carey is going to join me. He is a podcaster, an actor and a documentary maker. And there <laughs> you are and you're in New York. I'm in New York. I know, I hope I've set my camera up okay. Hang on. You look lovely. You look <laughs> very there. <laughs> and you and I met when you invited me to go on your um, Daddy Issues podcast, which was like 2019, right? Yeah, I know. It's so weird. Because we've had our bizarre interim in time for the world, it does feel, it was so, it was two years ago, but it feels like way longer than that. Time is a sort of lost time, hasn't it? Yeah. So, because we're, we're talking about grief and different people's experience of grief and finding both the unique aspects of it and the universal aspects of it. Um, so that people, because often grief can be so lonely and you can feel so mad all on your own. Yeah. And I thought maybe we could start if you could tell us what your story of grief was and, and how that led to the Daddy Issues podcast. Yes, so I um, lost my father in a car accident that myself and all of my family were in. And um, basically that then led- to How old were you? Sorry to interrupt. Seven, seven years old. You were seven. Seven. And so I, I think it was, and also because especially something so um, traumatic in the sense of the physical trauma as well, I think we just, uh, you know, we got we got on with it, and that was, um, you know, the it was the right thing to do at the time. But then, what? It can went... I pause you a second? Do you, yeah. can I ask intrusive questions? Because when you interviewed me, I couldn't ask you questions. <laughs> do you remember the um, accident? Do you remember I, being seven? Yeah, I do. I do remember it. Um, I was in and out of consciousness, so I have like sort of quite stark sort of dotted vivid yeah very vivid i remember a lot of feelings actually so much more kind of how i the thoughts that went through my mind are very present um more so you, images <clears throat> you bear to tell us because other people may have had yeah traumatic experiences and they may be able to connect with you i mean i don't want to re-traumatize you so no don't worry i've actually spoken about it as as because i'm making this documentary which is called grief story at the moment so i've spoken about it in detail recently but there was one particular so the first memory i have after the car must have been crashed into is i'm bending over myself um and uh, it was a bus that had crashed into us. It was quite a fall. Oh, God. I was bending over myself and I heard, I couldn't move, but I couldn't open my eyes because as you can see, I've got this scar. So I think my, um, there was sort of, not to be gory, but lots of blood. Blood, on. yeah. And mm. I remember hearing my younger sister crying for help. And she, so I was oh. seven, she was five. And that was something I, I also had a, have a scar inside my mouth. Um, but and I was trying to, because I lost my two front teeth, and I was trying to, which was actually probably the most traumatic thing, because I couldn't get the tooth bent. <laughs> no. But I, I remember being like, no, lost opportunity. Um, but I remember trying to sp speak and shout to her that she was okay, that I was here. And obviously- oh, Being a sort of caring big sister. Yeah, and I, it's so weird. I have this very vivid memory of being so stressed about Catra and my younger sister being on her own and crying. And I didn't know what had happened. I just knew she needed help. Um, so that's one of <laughs> But it's amazing how traumatic memories, you know, are so vivid and like they hold time. Like, it, like as you said it, although you've done it in a kind of, you know, way that we can hear it so not over emotional but it's like it's in your body like you remember the physical the mouth and the blood and the position your body position yeah as if it was like it was yesterday literally and it's so weird someone can say something and i'm sure anyone who's listening knows this from their own traumas but someone can say something and just trigger a memory like someone said something the other day and i went straight back to like another 
memory that's very stark for me. And I, you know, I wasn't being re-traumatized. It was nothing like that. It was just so weird how such small, you know, it does always live in you on some level. And I think it's, you won't actually ever forget them, but yeah. they, they, you have to find it obviously, as you know, very well, like a healthy relationship with them, which hopefully I've managed to do, but it took a bit of time for sure. Um, so, yeah. Does it kind of go back to your grief story? Your your mum, you know, had three children who no longer, you know, as a single parent with the, with their, their dad that had died in this incredibly traumatic way. So, and you know, thirty years ago, whenever it was, yeah, everybody was just like, forget and move on, just get yeah. on, you yeah. know, be brave. Yes, and I think it was this. So there were five of us, and it was we were all under the age of 10 and my mom was also terribly injured. So um, oh. we went to live with my, her parents. So our grand, my, my grandparents for um, about 18 months to kind of, for all oh. of us, get back on our feet a little bit. And uh, yeah, I think, wow. you know, for years I've always blamed the fact that, or, you know, boxed myself into the fact that I'm, an, you know, I've always been the actress of the family and more emotional. And so therefore, that's why, you know, my trauma was always sort of catching up with me. But I think there's a lot more to it than just me being a certain type of person. I think um, the age that I was at and, you know, the what I saw and experienced, like everyone, as you know, d deals with trauma and grief so incredibly differently. Um, but mine, mine was definitely something, uh, mine was the type of grief that I really needed to scream about. Like, I felt even when you were little so when you were seven eight nine ten it hit me when i was uh so there's an ongoing court case to do with my father's death which is slightly what the whoa doc yes yeah, so it was 22 years ago and it's like, it was the catalyst to me doing this documentary and i um aged 14 i developed anorexia nervosa when we had to go back to sri lanka where the incident happened for the first time and obviously i didn't know what what my lack of eating came from but you know it's bizarre that in hindsight it was no one categorized that as like a grieving child and i think that you know i was treated for the disease but i wasn't treated for the my... underlying cause yes exactly and so it was from the age of 15 to 14 that my grief had surfaced for the first time and was unresolved because it had come out as with a vengeance and then had nowhere to go and stayed trapped and essentially that then was me turned against yourself in some ways totally and i then ended up wanting to scream probably until about the age of 27 and and you know you would have no idea from the person i was displaying on the outside it was all very very internal and very shame i felt very ashamed that i was i that i felt like this i felt very very guilty ashamed embarrassed and i think that you know, there is so much shame that comes with grief. And my my version of grief was that. And it, it, it made me feel like I was um, not dealing with it well enough or that I was weak or that I had, an is you know, issues. And I think that was something that I'm trying to change with some of the work that I'm doing. But um, yeah, so age 27, I saw a psychotherapist for the first time and that changed oh my, my God. Mm. So, I mean, what from what you said, and it's, you know, I'm, obviously I'm not going to be practicing therapy with you, but what, you know, what I understand of working with families in, in a family system, everybody in a family will have their own unique response. Mm -hmm. And that the family, the whole family needs to recalibrate when a significant person has died. Yeah. And as, as I think I probably said in your podcast, it's like a mobile above a bed. When you cut off part of one piece of the mobile, the whole mobile is turned on its head. Mm -hmm. And so the family has to recalibrate and refigure themselves out. Yes. But what people don't understand is that everybody will have their own unique way of responding. Different siblings, different children at different times because of their ages, because of their personality, because of what they witnessed, because of their relationship with their dad, because yeah. of their position in the family. Mm -hmm all of that will be um, their own. And it, what it sounds like your experience was that 
you were the one in some ways that performed to begin with, like you were the funny one. Yeah. And that was a way of expressing yourself. Yeah. But then you kind of lost your voice and you couldn't speak. And you kind of turned against yourself in adolescence, which is a kind of prime time. And that somehow, and this is very common in grief too, that you felt there was something wrong with you, that you were faulty yeah. in some way. Yeah. You know, and that filled you with shame that you, I'm the one that's making the fuss or everybody else is coping. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And I'm not coping because everyone else is sort of getting on with their life. And grief, Ireland has said, grief is as unique as a fingerprint. That's a lovely way of saying it. Mm. Yes. I, that, it's so weird. You've literally hit the nail on the head with so much there. And it, it was a lot of it was, you know, comparing myself to, you know, siblings and the way that they seem to be coping. And why was I coping? So, you know, I wasn't being vocal. Um, it wasn't, I don't know, it wasn't, it was just so obviously coming out in quite an aggressive way. Whereas, you know, everybody else was coping in their own ways. And actually having, you know, doing this documentary and interviewing my siblings, I've learned all of their grief stories. And my goodness, I got all these very that must have been so healing it was so healing very difficult but so healing and I've got four incredibly different siblings we're all from the same parents but somehow it we look and sound and act and everything is different um but it was you know what someone goes through on their own um is just we just never really know ever the full story um but mine definitely is as you say like, i mean also me losing my voice was bang on because when i became anorexic i totally lost my personality because uh, yeah. you know, every inch of me my soul was gone for a bit and so um and, I and, a, and an eating disorder is a bit like an addiction and with addiction you know you because you become obsessed with not eating in whatever form that takes it may be over exercising it may be with food it may be both but it's rather than saying de focusing with the disorder you know with the with the pattern of eating and the and the way it's harming you like addiction not dealing don't deal with the drink say so what is the pain not what is the addiction mm. and that somehow got missed and and i think often gets missed like what is the pain that the eating disorder is in some way trying to anesthetize, in some way you were self-medicating against. Yes, exactly. And that's why, and I don't want to blame, obviously, I, I hate any cycle of blame or shame. So I think it's such a natural way that our society, you know, deal with problems. And I, I think it's just creating more problems and it's just silencing somebody else. However... Everyone is doing the best they can given the situation they're in, right? Exactly. But I do look back and I think how did someone not pick up on this? You know, how did someone not pick up on the fact that, and there, there are reasons, but I'm not gonna, um, I think the reasons go back to, you know, how we now look at therapy and how we now look at talking about our emotions. But I, I do find it baffling that being, you know, 14, 15, that no one did think, my goodness, you know, she's going back for a court she's case. She's a bereaved child. Yeah. And I mean, not, not like none. And all, all that happened is I got shamed for having an eating disorder, not by my family, by teachers. School and, and doctors and, and psychologists probably. Yes, actually there was one psychologist who was wonderful and he kind of changed mm -hmm. the whole thing because he made eating not seem scary. But I think that everyone else like you, you know, it, there's, there was so much, I feel like the world's changed. So I was 15 then, so that was 15 years ago. So the world has changed so much since then, which thankfully. is, yeah, thankfully, but it still has a way to go. <laughs> it's got a way to go. And actually, I mean, I look like I'm sweating <laughs> because the sun's still on my makeup. Hang on. <laughs> yeah, I can't notice that. I don't see that. Oh, okay. It's pitch black here. Um, no sun. But I, what I was thinking, I mean, I've, I've worked with other families and the other families, the, the now adult children and their parents or their mum in the ones that I've seen and actually a dad, another one, was what was everybody thinking? What were they doing? Why did they just leave us to get on? Why didn't they intervene? Why didn't, I mean, obviously your grandparents were amazing. Your, uh, it's just your mum's parents. Yeah. But it's like everyone just left them after like three months. Everybody just left them to it. Yeah. Yeah. And, it's and I think that still happens. Some one to one is saying, thank you. I'm grieving the death of my father. I'm so sorry at the moment. 
thank you. It is right. The dynamics change in the family. This is true. I've also lost my voice. Oh, I hope I hope this helps you find your voice. Mm. So has the the podcast helped you find your voice, the documentary and the podcast? Doing my podcast was life changing on so many levels. And I thank you obviously for being a part of that twice because it really you know, going to psychotherapy, so I'm now 30, so it's not been a huge amount of time since I've really, you know, gone on this journey of healing. And I think that I've always thought that I, I always thought that I was a really good psychotherapist for myself because I always somehow managed to, you know, I was put on a show. Yeah. And I somehow managed to sort of convince myself that I've dealt with this and I, you know, I, I would express myself by writing and music and, but I actually taking someone else challenging in a very gentle and obviously loving way some of my my narratives as well as me learning how not to be ashamed of so much and I had so much shame uh, not just you know with every ouch. with everything ouch 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 feeling yeah. defective so um, awful really I I was it was you know it was so deep rooted and I think it you know all of it pretty much stemmed from this from this car car accident and I think that you know learning how to find like when I did psychotherapy and then I really started to you know of course we are always changing there's always more to learn but I really learned about myself and I learned what was me what wasn't me um and you know what was my grief what were coping mechanisms and then how to sort of either let go of something or to actually find a way just to channel it because I quite like that and so then That's amazing yeah and I as I say, you know, there are always more things to work on, but my goodness, like it, on the outside, I hope I'm, I'm probably quite similar to friends who've known me since I was younger, but on the inside, I'm a totally different person. Like my, my sense of peace without sounding too, you know, but that's, that is, it's, it's what, it's what's been the gift that came from trying to work myself out. And that took a lot of work, but you know, it was a need. And I think that, then starting my podcast to answer your question and then going on to now the documentary that I'm making and all the other bits and bobs you know it's it was it was a way that I obviously still am doing it and I but it's a way that I'm channeling something that you know once caused me such pain to in a way that I think like anyone who does something which comes from a, a you know a experience of trauma it's an interesting it's been, now I look back at how I was at the beginning of the podcast to how I feel about it now. And I feel such a different person and just in the space of two years, but you know, wanting to do the podcast to speak about something that doesn't get spoken about very much, but also internally, I think I didn't admit then that it was also a way for me to keep healing because I'd done what I needed to do with my therapist. And then, well, we started, we continued to see each other for a little bit, but then suddenly I could find another way of expressing whatever I needed to do. And that for me was very helpful when I interviewed people and I learned a bit more about that. So, and then, you know, another endeavor is this film. So it's just like different ways on some level of just continuing some sort of <laughs> healing journey, which I'm very aware of, but there are obviously much bigger reasons why I'm doing them. I mean, it's, it, uh, it, I'm so, um, kind of energized by the productiveness if you like of like from going internally with your psychotherapist and then finding ways externally through the podcast and then through the documentary you through all of those different channels you get a different lens mm. because I think it is you know finding peace within yourself isn't just about kind of working out what hurts what's jagged what's getting in the way of friendships or love of love relationships or you and work but it's also normalizing and recognizing that this is part of you now. And part of that, it seems to me, what you're saying is that by learning other people's story, other people's experiences, mm. have identified yourself not as this is just me or me and my sibs with my mum, but it's everybody has a different version, but there is something that connects us all exactly. and that you learn something new every time. Yeah, and that's and that's curative. Yes, very. And I also I think it was a, a, a thing where you know if this has done so well, this was a huge part of it. You know, if, if talking had done so much for me, so much changed my whole life. And you know, it's if that's just I didn't do any other therapies. I literally just did sit down on the chair and speak. 
and you good know, therapist though you must have had a good therapist yes a brilliant therapist and I, I i also was very willing to be there and i think that you also have to really want to do Your it attitude, yeah. yeah and um because you know as i say there was also a lot of shame to go and see a therapist you know that was also part of everything um but i i realized that if this had changed so much about me and my understanding of myself which ultimately is really the goal for everyone because once you've understood yourself you can really go about in the world in the right way for yourself um in relationship with the others which is the exactly. thing that predicts your outcome exactly and you know i thought if this has happened to me then surely i can try and help somebody else tell their story which will help them better understand themselves and others who listen you know doing stuff like this in live Instagrams and listening to podcasts for me have, have completely changed so many thoughts that I've had for various different topics. And so it's, you know, speaking and listening is so incredibly powerful. So, you know, and we're all, as you were saying just now, very similar. So what someone can, someone's experiences may be incredibly different, but the feeling and the, the consequence can be incredibly similar. So you can apply something that's very different from in context from someone else to your life and actually you can still work out how to better your situation through their story um so that was something i realized by doing the podcast because you know if, if my therapist had helped me manage to do this then i would love to see if i can try to do the same <laughs> yeah <laughs> and so i mean when you look back at these 22 years and the and the last two years what and someone who's listening is at the beginning of their journey of grief, like the person that was talking about her dad's just died. Mm. I mean, this is a difficult question, but what would you, what do you wish ha had been different that you would do differently now or other people had been different? What do you think would have saved you quite a few years of suffering? Yes, talking. And I don't want to go back to, you know, this, what I've just been ranting on about, but really talking and not just keeping somebody alive and you know speaking about all the wonderful memories that's that's lovely and that's wonderful and that's needed and that's and is that what happened with you and your dad that people you went on talking about him as a family we would speak yes we would speak about him as a family but what i personally needed and what i think most people probably do need is to really think about how they feel and i think that that's that's something which i didn't have the tools nor the brain to well, then, so you just didn't know it was yeah. possible right it wasn't even a thing <laughs> no also you know being seven years old everything you you know you, you're very difficult to read as a child because you're you are just on some you know most of the time just on a very get on with life sort of behavior pattern but as an adult that's when you know things can really hit you but i i would say really try and find a safe person be that a therapist or a friend or whoever you can who to actually speak about how you feel and not be ashamed of any of it and yeah. I think that that's something which because it's really difficult to do because you might not even know how you feel so it's just to find someone who you can rant and waffle and talk nonsense with for ages like i i am um, and you know it's I, uh, when I first saw my therapist, I would sit down for, I mean, at least the first five or six sessions and just monologue about nonsense. And I was there just going, bada, bada, and it was nothing to do with my dad. Your dad or the ex. Like that was, it was nothing. And I was almost like, on, I was on fast forward. If you, you went around the houses. Ah, fast now, I was ranting. And it was, it was because it was so much above my trauma that I'd built that I didn't even know how to get to the bit that I needed to get to. And she obviously knew all this, so she was sort of navigating me throughout the whole process. But I had no idea what I was doing, or I was I had no self-awareness whatsoever about the point, the place that I was at, until I would then reflect on it like weeks later. Um, so there might be a lot of stuff that you think is pointless that comes out your mouth, but it always has a purpose if you're thinking about it. Because, it, I mean, my translation of what you're saying, and I think it is incredibly helpful, is that our feelings are messenger, A, are messengers of information, and that we can't adapt and go, grow through an event until we faced it. We can't fix what we don't face. Mm. 
-hmm. And there are many ways of voicing it. So it can be that through talking to a therapist, but you can, you can do it by journaling. There are ways of expressing yeah. it, but the, the process of adapting and growing through your grief, learning to live with it by experiencing the pain. And the grief is such a tidy word for so many feelings of rage, of jealousy, of fury, of, you know, there are so many versions of yourself that you don't want to be feeling. You don't feel just sad. Mm -hmm. You you want to kill lots of people, the driver, your dad for dying, your mum for not saving it. You know, so many conscious and unconscious Mm. experiences and when they stay in Kohe in your body they contaminate every other feeling that you have and influence your behavior so until you find a way of having a way of going down finding a way of expressing them letting them out in the world and then being received so either by you in a journal or by a therapist or a friend Italy. they can't change no. they stay completely as if they were there all the time and they build on themselves. And so as difficult as it is to face the truth in oneself and the kind of versions of oneself that you kind of feel as we talked about, as you've talked about, ashamed of or um, that in some way you feel defective, mm -hmm. you, you kind of hamper yourself, don't you, until more and more. And, and some one-to-one -one is saying anger, guilt, shame, worry, fear, lack of hope. Yes. But do you know what you've just, so I have an example of this that happened to me that is quite an interesting, like linear okay. thing. So when I obviously lost my father age seven, and then that it would have resulted in some sort of abandonment issue as well as trauma, grief, etc. But then when I got anorexia nervosa age 14, because we were going back to Sri Lanka where this incident had happened, I then... Um, obviously lost my personality and so you know father dying was consequence of then became anorexia nervosa and then anorexia nervosa then became later on because I'd lost my personality for so long I really had trust in yourself I yeah confidence I had, everything everything I forgot how to laugh I remember oh four, my god yeah oh no I'm married that's so sad I know it was really miserable and I remember um forcing myself to to sort of laugh at jokes I didn't find funny and stuff because I wanted to get my friends back and I you know age 14 or 50 they had no you bloody need to be with your gang you need to be with your group yeah exactly and so by doing that what happened was I then started to become a really intense people pleaser because I think I put other people in front of myself for so long in a social setting and then in my 20s I didn't even know that this came from that, but I developed really terrible social anxiety. And then I would oh goodness. become quite self-indulgent because I was trying to like get away from, you know, I'd become quite self-destructive because I was trying to sort of find a way to socialize a bit better and easier and, you know, basically sort of forget myself for a little bit. And I only realized this having gone to therapy because I then saw the pattern of how that- and it, All these negative coping mechanisms to block pain. Exactly. They one built on the other and compounded the other until there was very little of you that was left up and running. Like you were kind of suffocating yourself with your behaviours and you were barely alive, yeah. let alone thriving. Totally. But my identity was so attached to all these really negative, and it's what you said about one thing that you don't deal with contaminating the rest. And that was what I found so fascinating looking back on it because I was, you know, the this it was the root of one thing that I had no idea was connected to the other thing you know I thought social anxiety came from being socially conscious or you insecure. know very too much or insecure but actually it really did come from this other thing and it's 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 finding out all of those things which take time because you don't think one thing might be related to this other thing but interestingly it often is <laughs> and well, because it, you, as, it, as you've said your relationship with yourself as the central kind of organizer of yourself was completely distorted. Mm. So that all the coping mechanisms that you were the best that you could do at the time that you developed, they disconnected you from your kind of authentic self. Mm -hmm. And so your internal of a locus of evaluation, as we call it in the trade, was wow. completely negative.
and you're ex you were totally externally located so it was how somebody saw you how somebody responded to you but then of course you work so hard to get that you get the complete reverse and so you your your relationship with yourself gets more and more contaminated and more and smaller and smaller until you, you sounded like you barely existed Oh, I, I'm I, living with family grief saying such a helpful conversation. Thank you for sharing your story. I think codependency is so real in child bereavement. So many layers. I think that's absolutely right. Thank you. Mm. No, it really is. It was a crisis of identity to the next level. And I think that because I had absolutely no idea who I was, I completely had lost my sense of self from not only the accident for various reasons, but then this anorexia. And, you know, it can happen to, it doesn't have to be stuff that seems as radical as my experiences. It can happen to anyone for different things. And for, you know, there's no, you don't, everything's incredibly relative, but I just had no idea who I was. No idea. Like none. And I was aware. And also you didn't connect it to your dad dying. No. I mean, <laughs> None of it. I was, I was almost... Didn't have a story to tell yourself. You had no story. <laughs> no, my, my story was my, um, you know, being an actress and, and that was failing because, you know, being an actress, how is anyone going to employ me if I don't even know who I am? I, I think that there was so much of it. It was like this vicious cycle of just destruction. Pub and, rock, yeah. Yeah, and I needed to put a stop to it and I, 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 I did. <laughs> well think, done. I mean, my goodness. <laughs> That, it's so lovely to see you sort of vibrant and alive and yourself yeah. and oh, authentic yeah. and, you know, like flourishing. That is such a, a lovely witnessing to kind of hear where you've come from and how you've got there. That is amazing. It doesn't mean that you won't have times of missing your dad or mm. times of feeling the loss or, but it's... Really? feels like through the work that you've done that you have a, a core sense of yourself, of what you believe, who you are, and trust in yourself. And that can support you through difficult times. Whereas when you didn't have that, you were fragmented and you had nowhere to go. It right. just got more and more chaotic and more and more frightening. I wasn't, I honestly wouldn't have been able to have gone anywhere had I, in terms of, I'm not speaking about obviously career or anything, but just gone anywhere within myself if I hadn't just stopped and let myself really indulge, you know, like really indulge in myself. I, I you know, it's got, it's a, you know, I spoke to someone else, someone recently, a friend of mine who was talking about potentially going to therapy and he was saying, you know, it's such a selfish thing to do though. And I was like, I mean, it really isn't. It's a selfless thing to do because trust me, you're going to be a better person to everybody else around you once you've sorted out whatever it is you need to sort out. Um, and it's preventative medicine. But I mean, I know what, pe so when people say that, I think what they believe is that it's indulgent, that you should be just white knuckle it and get over yourself and get on. But the truth, I mean, there are many ways, you know, therapy isn't for everybody there, but whatever route you take, you have to find a way of dealing with what has happened to you and yeah. knowing yourself and being in touch with yourself. Can I do some messages from other people? So this, the self space who are great therapists said that powerful moment and display of integration and consciousness. So that was that moment when you kind of know who I am and Mm. what that means and what that looks like and how you are in the world is an amazing thing mm. and the urban myth fashions said my anorexia appeared after 20 years after major loss and ptsd and that is true it can just sit there in waiting can't it until uh, probably another loss in some way some other experience goes into the pre-existing fault line and then it blows up. And Elle Faulkner said, thank you for sharing this. I feel what you have felt. It's amazing to hear someone else who's experienced this too. It, I mean, so you're doing the healing yes. that you needed by helping other, by speaking is helping other people. Hugely. But also, sorry, there was one more thing I'd love to go. You said something about um, trusting yourself. And it was that actually, I mean, you said it before, without me even having to say it with, you know, you knew that that meant that I'd connected with myself because that's essentially what it is you start to trust yourself and I remember another story I was running up a, <laughs> running up a hill and uh, I wanted to break up I want I knew I should break up with my boyfriend and I was in a, a terrible relationship where I was platforming him way above myself which was quite classic me you know at the time 
that's how my daddy issues sort of came about and um I was totally lost anyway and I remember running up this hill and right at the top I just had this like eureka moment where I I was like panting having sprinted up this hill and I was like it really shouldn't be this hard love shouldn't be this hard life shouldn't be this hard I shouldn't it all just shouldn't be this hard and then I I had this feeling eureka of, moment yeah and I had this feeling about light bulb where my gut suddenly for the first time and it, you know at the time I had nothing in my in my brain I had nothing if I broke up with him so you know because I put everything onto him and literally my gut was like you have to break up with him and it was I remember I went downstairs got home told mum, and I was like mum. I'm going to break up with, mm. and she was like, oh, okay. And she was like, are you okay? And I was like, yeah, I'm absolutely fine. And I literally didn't even, I didn't cry for about six months. It was like my body knew that it had to do what it had to do in order to heal, in order to find myself. And that was the very, very, f and then I cried a bit afterwards when, you know, it was too late. It was like it knew that it had to wait a certain period of time for him not to want to go back to me, etc. And it was the fir very first time that I learned what a gut was <laughs> because i had and to trust your gut to trust your instinct totally and i have Isn't that, no, that's an amazing place to stop actually i mean we we could talk for for hours <laughs> yeah, <I know>. but, <laughs> um, your therapist must have really enjoyed working with you it must have been really um an interesting a very vibrant uh, relationship <laughs> But Ang Harry, thank you so much. So t t just tell us where people can find you and when your documentary is coming out and yeah. all of that. So I uh, am found on this Instagram, Ang Harry George Kerry at Gmail. Sorry, that's my email. <laughs> Ang Harry George Kerry. My email is Ang Harry George Kerry at gmail.com. But um, I also have a production company called Three Dragons Productions, which is very new. So stay if anyone wants to, there's some exciting things going on there. So just putting the name out. Um, exciting. I'm very exciting. I'm writing a book, which is very exciting. Wow. Um, so that will have You're busy. all of these insights. And then my documentary, which uh, should probably be out because I'm following a live court hearing. So it's a bit ambiguous as to when we can end it, but it will probably be about a year's time. But if you follow mm. me on Instagram, then I will, then you'll stay up in the loop anyway. <laughs> Incredible that the court case is 22 years late after the accident. Yeah, yeah, I know. Crazy. We have. We'll find out in the documentary. <laughs> thank you, Ang Harrod. Lovely, lovely seeing you. Oh. And um, thank you, everyone who joined and participated. And tell yeah. us your story. And um, I hope you got something that's helpful for you. Send you all lots of love. I'm talking to Cariad tomorrow at one o'clock. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. Fabulous. Lots of okay. love. And Lots of love. Bye.